I'm Dr. Alan Kadish, the president of Turo University. Still feels good saying that. And it's my pleasure to welcome everyone tonight on behalf of our board and the entire institution. Tonight, we have an extraordinarily special program. As part of Turo's 50th anniversary celebration, the Lander College for Women, one of our flagship schools, is hosting a dual award tonight, the Bruce Gould Book Award and the Lander College for Women, Women of, Women of Valor Award. We're honored to have Turo trustees Abe Biederman and Rabbi Menachem Genak with us tonight. And in addition to Bruce Gould, whom I'll talk about in a moment, to have some members of our Board of Advisors here as well. This is the first live Gould Book Award presentation in two years, and I'm thrilled that we're all able to get together here in person at Lander College for Women. Congratulations to Dean Langen and Dean stoltz loike on these achievements. We thrive because of the talent of the people who are at Turo, and thank all of you who've helped Turo and are part of our organization for all you, you do. It's now my pleasure to speak about Bruce Gould. Bruce has been a longtime friend of Turo. He's the chair of the Turo Board of Governors, an extraordinarily philanthropist, and a longtime supporter of the Turo Law Center. To give context to this evening's ceremonies, the Gould Book Award has been presented in the past to a number of distinguished recipients, including two Supreme Court justices, some best-selling novelists, and three U.S. Senators. In short, the award, which spotlights scholarship and celebrates excellence in publishing, has remained a shining star of the academic activity that we do at Turo, and I want to thank Bruce and his family for continuing to support it. When Dr. Lander opened Turo Law Center, he was hoping that we would have graduates like Bruce Gould, who would not only study law, but have an impact on society, an impact on philanthropy, and continue to support the institution, as well as the several different communities in which Bruce lives. Bruce entered the Turo Law Center in 1980. While there, he served as the second president of the Student Bar Association and graduated in 1984, receiving his JD, and he also has a Master of Legal Letters from NYU. Bruce has played a vital role in Gould Publications, a family-owned publishing business that began in 1953 and specialized in law books and treatises for the law enforcement community. The company, which was sold in 2004, was one of the leading law publishers in the country. Bruce's life has been more than an outstanding, impactful career. We think of his family's dedication, generosity, and leadership. The Gould Book Award was established in 1990 and has been one of the most prestigious awards for a book that's generally been about legal affairs. And the novelists who've won, including John Grisham, have been those who've written about the law. In 1994, Bruce and his family also endowed the Bruce Gould Distinguished Professorship of Law, currently held by Professor Rena Seplowitz. In 1999, when we began our Central Islip Building Campaign, Bruce ran the campaign and raised more than $15 million for what's an outstanding physical facility. How does Bruce find time for all of this? He makes time because he recognizes that this is important. He sits on the Strategic Planning Committee for the university and has created the law school's 40th anniversary celebration. In fact, I could spend the rest of the night talking about what Bruce has meant to Turo and his community, but then uh, we actually wouldn't get to the awards. So Bruce, I'm gonna stop there if that's okay with you. Um, I wanna just say a couple of words about tonight's awardees. Uh, I've met the Liebermans only casually, uh, but I look forward to getting to know them better. Uh, you all know their stories, but I uh, have spent a little bit of time reviewing their books over the past couple of days. And, and Hadassah's book is a tremendous achievement in describing in very down-to-earth terms an amazing personal achievement with tremendous success, but also how to deal with and overcome adversity. 
and I found it extraordinarily powerful. And Joe Lieberman's book, The Centrist Solution, I don't think one could imagine a more important book for today. At a time when the world seems to be split by amazing divisions, when American politics has spread away from the center and been controlled by radical elements of all types, the idea that we incorporate the Maimadim principles of trying to find the middle and what characterized Joe's career, this has never been more important. It really hasn't. We need this kind of leadership in the United States, people who are able to bring people together to find solutions that will work and make this country a better place. I'm not one of those who believes that the country is really in terrible shape. We have a lot of things we can make better, and for that, we need to work together. We need to restore the spirit where we have common principles that underlie the way we run the United States. And for that, we need to look like lead to leaders like Joe Lieberman, who even though he's not in the Senate, continues to wield immense influence. Bruce, please come up and uh, introduce the award. Thank Thanks you a lot. So much. Thank you, Dr. Kadish, for that warm and wonderful introduction. Dr. Kadish and I have the very similar speechwriters because a lot of the uh, points that I was going to make in my speech, uh, Dr. Kadish so eloquently made. But I want to I want to tell you a little bit about the award. But uh, first, I want to welcome everybody. Provost Salkin, where are you? Dean Langan, Dean Stoltz, Loki, members of the Turo community, students, friends, and especially our amazing award recipients, former. United States Senator Joseph Lieberman and Mrs. Lieberman, welcome and thank you. It is a great pleasure to welcome you here to Turo and to the 22 presentation of the Turo Law Center Gold Book Award together with the Turo University Lander College of Women of Valor Award. We have, <laughs> we have many firsts as, as, as Dr. Kadish alluded to. This is the first live presentation we've had it, of this award in, in some time, in two years since COVID began. Um, it's the first time we're presenting it here in New York City. We usually do it out on Long Island where the law school is in Central Islip. It's the first time this is a university-wide event, and it's the first time that we're presenting it as a part of a joint ceremony. And uh, I couldn't be more thrilled and. I'm, I'm so happy that we were able to do it tonight and get back to some normalcy, so thank you. Um, it was almost 35 years ago when I sat down with Dean Emeritus Howard Glickstein, who's right here in the front row. In fact, we have a number of deans from the law school, Provost uh, Salkin and Harry Ballin, uh, both uh, former deans of the law school. I want to thank you for being here tonight um, to discuss and create this uh, program. And we wanted to, when Howard and I sat down, we wanted to mesh my work in legal publishing and my love of books while bringing positive attention to a relatively new law school, at the same time expose students to a world, world class speakers. We discussed a number of ideas and eventually centered on this award to honor the author of an outstanding publication related to the law, the legal profession, and our legal system. I don't think either of us could have imagined how much of an impact this award would have on the school and the legal community. The quality, variety, and prestige of the recipients and the tremendous positive impact of the reputation to the school has been amazing. The award has become one of the leading le legal literary awards in the country. Over the years, we've had some unbelievable, insightful, fascinating, and timely presentations from recipients. They've included, as Dr. Kadish told you, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, Justice Sonia Sotomayor, Alan Dershowitz, Bob Woodward, Ambassador Stuart Eisenstadt, John Grisham, U.S. Senators Daniel Patrick Moynihan and Christopher Dodd. And just last year, we had U.S. Senator Amy Klobuchar, who, by the way, mentioned that you were her professor Senator Lieberman at Yale Law School. And she did say that she got one of the highest grades in the class, so she was very thankful for that. She also gave um, uh, a, a, a wonderful speech about how she never dreamt 
that she would be serving in the U.S. Senate with you. So she was really thrilled to be able to, to do that, and it was one of the thrills of her life. I am uh, excited that we're able to, um, to have some of my family here tonight and uh, that we, we have a, a family fair as well because we're honoring both of the Liebermans, and I'm really excited that we bestow not only the Gould Book Award, but the University's Woman of Valor Award to Hadassah Lieberman. So congratulations. <laughs> Dean Stoltz Loki, thank you so much for hosting us this evening and lending your dedicated staff that worked tirelessly to make this event a tremendous success. Dean Wagon, congratulations as always for putting on another fantastic evening. Dean Weissman, who's sitting over here. The Dean and I have worked probably 25 years together and every year we have worked tirelessly to put on another presentation of this award and every year seems to get better and better. It's been a pleasure working with you on this event and I know both of us have had a passion to make it one of the best events and I want to thank you for your leadership. <laughs> to the Law Center's Advancement Office and the University's Executive Leadership, kudos on a, a job well done. They're all over and they have worked really hard to make this a beautiful event. There's so many people I want to recognize and it would take probably here to midnight like like uh, Dr. Kadish said about uh, some of my accomplishments, but I want to recognize one person, uh, my good friend, Rob Schwartz, who I worked on the, uh, the Begin documentary. And if you hadn't had a chance to see it, I encourage you to see it. It is a fantastic uh, um, uh, story. And, and uh, Senator was involved in it, and it is a um, presentation of Menachem Begin's life. Prime Minister Menachem Begin, and it, it is a fantastic thing. Um, my good friend, he was very instrumental in connecting us and getting, uh, getting the Liebermans here tonight, so I want to thank you, and uh, you're always a good friend, and I appreciate it. My mom is here tonight. I want to recognize her. She is 94 years young, so can, she, and she's going, and she's going, and she, she can't be more happy and more thrilled to be here at all these wonderful events. My brother Robert is here, and the rest of my family who support me and all these wonderful Simcas, I really do appreciate it. On the behalf of the law school, the university, myself, my family, I want to welcome you, and uh, I please enjoy the presentation. It is now my pleasure to welcome Rabbi Menachem Kanak. Did I say that properly? Longtime member of the university's board of trustees and a very good friend of the Liebermans who wants to say a few welcoming remarks. Thank you so much and enjoy. I'm going to follow uh, Senator Lieberman's uh, colleague, Chuck Schumer's advice. He always said every speaker should remember the three B's. Be truthful, be short, be seated. So. I, it is my distinct pleasure and honor to be part of tonight's program. I'm thrilled to have two illustrious honorees, both dear friends of mine, who have contributed so much to our community and to our collective pride. Senator Joe Lieberman's book, The Center Solution, discusses the vital role of the moderate, which resonates impeccably with the teachings of the Rambam, who speaks about the Shvil Hazov the, center, the central way, and who taught about pursuing the middle ground. And Hadassah Lieberman's book, Hadassah, An American Story, brings vivid detail to her life's journey, a chronicle that is the retelling, in, in the retelling contributes to the body of literature that celebrates life and the understanding of the human condition. Um, I just wanted just a few stories about Joe Lieberman, one I shouldn't be sharing here tonight, but I remember Joe, at OU Press, we have the pleasure and the honor of having published two of Joe Lieberman's books, one, The Gift of, of Rest, about Shabbos, and also a book he wrote about Shavuos and the law. Um, the book about Shabbos was so inspiring, especially for people who don't know about Shabbos, 
I sent it out to all OU companies, and I think I told Joe, there was one woman, um, an executive of one of the companies, and she told me she's not Jewish, but she was very inspired, and it meant a lot to her because her matern maternal grandmother used to light candles. Little does she know. Um, and one story that I shouldn't tell, but I remember Joe telling me that this sort of in the Senate cloakroom, when a senator would publish a book, that he said one criteria that he has to at least have read it. And, but this book, not only did, did Joe and Hadassah write, but it represents exactly who they are. Um, I'm just gonna tell, you know, Joe and I, it's my honor that every week we learn, we learn Torah together. We've been doing this 30 years, I can't remember exactly how long. Um, but at Joe Lieberman and Hadassah have been strong, strong supporters of the Israel-American relationship and have played critical roles so much they made a contribution to Israel, namely that their daughter, Hani, now lives there with their, her family. And I remember you said you honored Christ, Christard also as an honoree. I remember at Hani's wedding, Hani had, uh, the mechitza was, Hani required a mechitza, of course, and for the dancing, and there, there was a, a beautiful painting on the mechitza of Yushalayim and the Kotel, and anyhow, during the dancing, there was one point I was dancing together with Joe and his colleague, Chris Dodd, and I remember Joe telling him, he said, when you dance at this wedding, looking at the mechitza, said, you affirm your support for of course, Joe was saying this tongue in cheek. You affirm your support for settlement enhancement. <laughs> One of the things we love about Joe is his wonderful sense of humor. Um, so I'm going to just end at this point. What, what the Liebermans have represented for us, for our, our community, but most, more generally for the American community, represents absolutely the best in the United States. And in this time, this corrosive time in terms of the political environment, they have so much to offer. And their legacy, hopefully, in terms of moderation and decency, will be followed by others. So now um, it gives me pleasure to introduce Elena Langen, Dean of the Law School, who will give a formal introduction of Senator Lieberman and present him with the Gould Book Award. Good evening. Senator Lieberman, the Democratic vice presidential nominee in 2000, served 24 years. <laughs> I have a great mic assistant here. Um, Senator Lieberman served 24 years in the United States Senate, retiring in January 2013 at the end of his fourth term. During his tenure, the senator helped shape legislation in virtually every major area of public policy, including national homeland security, foreign policy, fiscal policy, environmental protection, human rights, health care, trade, energy, cybersecurity, and taxes. In the Senate, he served in leadership roles, including as chair of the Committee on Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs, and led numerous congressional investigations, including investigations into Enron's collapse, the federal government's response to Hurricane Katrina, the Fort Hood mass shooting, and the deadly attack in Benghazi, Libya. Prior to his election to the Senate, Joe Lieberman served as the Attorney General to the State of Connecticut for six years. He also served 10 years in the Connecticut State Senate, including three years as Majority Leader. He received his BA from Yale and his LLB from Yale Law School. He's a double Yaley. He currently serves as Senior Counsel to the law firm of Kasowitz, Benson, and Torres. In addition to practicing law, he has authored eight books, including The Centrist Solution, and he is an honorary national founding chair of No Labels, an American political organization you'll hear more about this evening. He co-chairs 
the Bipartisan Commission on Biodefense, and serves on the Board of Trustees of the McCain Institute for International Leadership, the Board of Trustees for the Institute for the Study of War, and the Board of Directors of the Center for a New American Security. It is my honor to present Senator Joe Lieberman with the 2020 Bruce K. Gould Book Award. I would invite the Senator, Bruce, and Dr. Kadish to please join me at the podium. <laughs> but, but, but not too far, right? You can hold both of these. They're well, kind of heavy. Be yeah. careful. Yeah. That's beautiful. I may actually use this. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take care of these. If Thanks, you would, um, you can go ahead up onto the stage okay. now. Okay. We'll join you there in a minute. Good. Yes, yeah, so I hear it. Yeah. Is there a I'm going to stay here for a minute. I should sit in. I'm going to sit in the middle. Okay, good. The hot seat. As the senator takes his seat, I want to let you all know that there are index cards at your chairs along with pencils. If you would like to ask any questions of the senator or Mrs. Lieberman, please write your questions down and we will have volunteers come around the room and bring those questions up for our question and answer period, which will occur after uh, both the Senator and Mrs. Lieberman have had an opportunity to speak with all of you. Thank you. Dean, if you'll, if you'll give me uh, what we used to call in the Senate a point of personal privilege, I want to uh, thank uh, Dr. Kadish and uh, uh, Bruce Gould and Rabbi Ganak for their kind words. Um, they mean a lot to me, and I, I want to accept this award with gratitude and appreciation as the honor it is. First, because uh, Bruce Gould, who's established himself both as a lawyer and as a, um, a, a philanthropist, is the one who created it in his name. Secondly, uh, it honors two things that mean a lot to me, which is uh, the law and um, and, and the printed word, I mean, Jews are after all the people of the book. And uh, um, over time we've proven that we're the people of many books. And I'm grateful that I have been able to write a few myself, including the one that you are kind enough to honor tonight. So I begin with a thank you. Oh, and thank you, Senator Lieberman. It is truly a privilege for me to be here with you this evening. And pose some questions to you. Okay. So first of all, um, thank you for the book. I appreciate the warm signature that you provided. And I'd like to ask you, what motivated you to write this book? Yeah. So um, I mean, the, really what's happening in uh, Washington today, which is uh, too much division, too much partisanship, not enough uh, uh, working together across party lines, not enough uh, ultimate loyalty to what's good for the country or even your constituents back home. Um, and I, I was, uh, I was uh, privileged to be in the Senate for 24 years, 1989 to 2013, and um, I found that the partisanship and division just got uh, worse and worse over that period of time. Uh, and uh, watching it from outside after I left, it pained me in some ways even more uh, because I continued to identify with the institution and I know how important it is to have uh, the federal lawmaking body uh, set a standard for the rest of the country. So this is a book that I really have wanted to write for years now and the truth be told, um, and this may be in the category of making a lemonade out of lemons. When the, the pandemic came along, and you know, I wasn't traveling anymore. I wasn't even taking the time to commute into Manhattan to the law firm. I was at home. Okay, I was on Zoom a lot, 
But uh, I had time and I said, you know what? I'm going to try to write that book to make the case for centrism um, and to make the case that it comes, as uh, Rabbi Ganak particularly said, it, it comes out of not only American history, but you know, Greek philosophy, uh, Jewish theology, and the history of America, where uh, because we are a democracy and we have rules of our legislative body, that you really can't get anything done unless you work across party lines to make that happen. And there is a process. I define centrism in the book as something different from moderation, although most, if I can confuse you, most moderates are centrist. But centrism is about people from the left and right and center, from the Democratic and Republican Party and independents coming to the center, coming to common ground, uh, talking to each other civilly and respectfully, which doesn't seem to be the um, mode in Washington these days, negotiating, compromising, because you can't get anything done without compromising, and then getting something done for the country. Uh, solving a problem, uh, seizing an opportunity. And you know, this in the book, I, I try to make this argument, this is a strategy for making our government work. Uh, but I also uh, want to show the reader that this has happened throughout our history and only if we will it, if I can paraphrase Herzl, it is no dream if we will it. Uh, it can happen again, and I, I go back to the Constitution. There were some significant disagreements that could have uh, made it impossible to really start this country, but they were ultimately compromised. Um, for instance, they had a big dispute in uh, the Constitutional Convention between the large population states so I'm, see, I'm at a university setting, so I'm going to be a little academic here for a moment. Uh, the large population states, which were led by Virginia, and the small population states, and this shows you how things can change, which were led by New Jersey. And of course, the big population states wanted the legislative body to, to uh, be apportioned based on population. And the small population states, uh, wanted it to be wanted there to be equal representation from each of the original states, and believe it or not, uh, in in the summer of that year when they were adopting the Constitution, they reached such uh, a, a gridlock as we call it today that they had a recess, and the resolution emerged. I'm very proud, parochially to say, from two delegates from Connecticut. Sherman and Ellsworth. And uh, some people mistakenly call their compromise the great compromise. The real name of it is the Connecticut compromise. <laughs> and strangely enough, what did they recommend? One body, to, let's have two chambers in Congress, not one. One representing population, the House, we'll call it, and the second equal representation, we'll call it the Senate. So right from the beginning, and I, I also like to point out, I'll do this quickly, you don't have to go back too far to find this kind of bipartisan uh, compromise and accomplishment. Um, uh, Lyndon Johnson and Everett Dirksen, uh, you know, Dirksen used to castigate Johnson on the floor of the Senate. Now, what was Johnson's reaction? He had the White House staff call Dirksen and say, Senator, President would like to have you up here this evening for a drink. Um, I tell this story too often. People say, maybe the problem in Congress is you're not drinking enough uh, together. And they, were, and they, you know, they, through their trust, passed the Civil Rights Act, those two more than any others. Um, Reagan and Tip O'Neill, conservative Republican, liberal, Democrat uh, basically saved Social Security during the 80s. They happened to have liked each other, 
And uh, I once talked to somebody who worked in the Reagan White House, said once he had a meeting with the president, uh, they told him the president was in the Oval Office, and he kept hearing these gales of laughter coming out. And um, the door finally opened up, and it was Reagan arm in arm with O'Neill laughing. And when he went in, uh, he said, Mr. President, I'm curious, what was going on? Oh, Tip and I were swapping Irish jokes. Uh, and they, uh, and then, uh, in the most unusual, in a way, of two people who were very different ideologically, and didn't particularly like each other, but knew that they had to work together to get something done. President Clinton, and Speaker Gingrich, and they adopted uh, criminal justice reform, welfare reform, and the greatest of all, the uh, uh, budget, uh, balanced budget act of 1997, which actually balanced the budget. It's hard to remember now. The last three Clinton presidential years, we had a surplus in the federal government. Seems like ancient history today. So it can be done, and uh, I wrote the book with the hope that it will be done again. I, I just would end on this invocation. Um, the only way it will be done is if the people who are the voters demand it of their representatives in Congress. So you've talked about the accomplishments of others who use the centrist approach. What do you consider to be your biggest accomplishment while you served in the Senate? Uh, well, thanks for asking. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I will tell you this first, that all of the uh, accomplishments that I'm proudest of were achieved with work across party lines. They were bipartisan. But you know what, you don't have to be a genius to figure this out. You need, uh, so long as the filibuster rule exists, you need um, 60 votes to break a filibuster. Very rare that one party has 60 of the 100 senators. So you gotta have some Republican support or Democratic support, both parties. I never introduced anything that I really cared about where I didn't have a Republican co-sponsor. Uh, I would say that, and I talk about these examples in The Central Solution, probably the, the part that I'm, I'm proudest of is what we did after 9-11 to both create the Department of Homeland Security, don't tell anybody that we also created the TSA, which, <laughs> yeah, when I'm going through the line and one of the security people says, oh, Senator, we know you created us, thank you very much. I said, just keep it quiet. <laughs> people are not so happy about it. Uh, and then uh, we created the 9-11 Commission, a uh, great bipartisan commission, and then we worked together across party lines to adopt uh, almost all of its recommendations. Uh, in that, uh, my partners range from Fred Thompson uh, from Tennessee, Republican on Homeland Security Department, um, John McCain on the creation of the 9-11 Commission, and uh, Susan Collins and John McCain on the adoption of those recommendations. Now, we had the advantage of the country having been traumatized by this catastrophic terrorist attack, but still there was reluctance at different times uh, and both partisanship and fear of partisanship that could have held it up, but we rose above that uh, and got it done. I, probably that's the thing I'm proudest of. In the book, I also talk about my work on the Clean Air Act, on the Balanced Budget Amendment, um, on some foreign policy, the, war, the, end of, the war to end aggression and genocide in the Balkans, uh, and the repeal of the uh, discriminatory don't ask, uh, don't tell law. So these are, uh, these all happened because people were willing to reason together Incidentally, this is part of the Jewish tradition, I want to say here at Toro. Uh, how did the Talmud, which governs our lives if we're observant Jews, emerge? It emerged from centuries of discussion, debate, disputation between scholars and rabbis who ultimately um, found a, a position that they could agree on. And in any case, even if they didn't, dis didn't agree, they ended up with great respect for one another. There's a wonderful story told in the Talmud, I won't tell it about a, a, two rabbis who studied together and one of them passed away prematurely. 
And the students of the other rabbi, the surviving rabbi, saw that he was terribly depressed. And they found him another great scholar to be as part of his uh, chevrusa. And uh, after about two or three days, he told them to take this man away. They wanted to know more of it. Why? He said, because everything I say, he finds, Rabbi, I forgot the number, 10, 20 reasons to support my position. My, my former Hebrusa uh, would always find 10 or 20 reasons to challenge my position, and that led us to a conclusion that was more wise, more truthful, and more effective. And that's a paradigm of Jewish tradition that um, my former colleagues in the Congress could benefit from using as an example. You also talk about the, your, how your centrist approach helped you in your political career. Want to talk about some examples of that? Uh, well, you know, when you, when you decide in a, look, I'm, I'm, I, I was privileged to serve in a state that I think honored in the, Connecticut, honored independence of thinking, because Connecticut, um, in Connecticut, the <clears throat> largest group of voters are unaffiliated, they're independents. Now that's happening now in more and more states around the country. Um, I have a friend who said, and I've quoted it so many times that I stopped giving him credit, but he said that the fastest growing political party in America today is no party. It's independence. And that is a market statement, a popular statement of disaffection from the two major parties, which more people think are not really representing them. So I was lucky to have that um, uh, state in which I uh, came along. But um, the danger in, the mo in modern politics, and I suffered it in 2006 when I had a challenge, uh, a Democratic primary challenge, which I lost, and I was lucky to be able to run as an independent, which I won, all about one issue, the Iraq war, which you know, was a serious issue. But uh, the fear now, and it affects our politics, is um, that you, you, if you are a centrist, the greatest risk you take is that whether you're a Republican or Democratic centrist, you will be challenged for re-election, not in the, on election day, but on primary day. And you could be in trouble. And that actually works to make too many members of Congress, of both parties, risk averse because they don't want to face a primary and maybe not getting uh, re-elected. And you know, you can't get anything significant done if you're not willing to take a risk. So I'm not sure I answered your question exactly. I would say that um, I do think, well, part of my centrism, I think, was part of why I was able to get elected in Connecticut. I mean, I, in my first Senate race, I got, I had the strangest coalition of people, in part because of my Republican opponent, who was the incumbent senator, who was kind of an, a, a tough guy and, and had displeased a lot of people. But I was endorsed by uh, the, uh, a previous Republican candidate for governor, Dick Pizzuto, who had been my colleague in the state Senate. We were just friends, and he didn't like Senator Weicker. I was endorsed by a man named Pat Sullivan, who uh, had run the Reagan campaigns in Connecticut, and he also didn't like Weicker. And the most uh, hilarious but wonderful of all, I was endorsed by William F. Buckley Jr., <laughs> uh, who I knew because he was a Yale graduate. He had graduated, oh, 10 or 12 years before I did. But uh, he had been the editor of the newspaper at Yale, and I was, and he took a real interest in it. And we stayed in touch. He lived in Connecticut. He, uh, <laughs> I'll tell you briefly. I don't know why. But <laughs> he, uh, when I was running for the Senate, he called me up. And you know, if you remember, Buckley had this elegant English type voice. Joe, I said, yes, Bill, how are you? I'm thinking of something. Uh, I want you to react to it. I'm thinking of endorsing you in this campaign. <laughs> I said, really? He said, yes. Uh, he said, you know, uh, I admire you. 
and uh, I even like you. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we have very different points of view, but you're a decent person. And uh, that Lowell Weicker, I despise him, you know. <laughs> well, he despised him because Weicker had been a thorn in the side of um, President Reagan, who was uh, Buckley's great hero. So Buckley said, I, I won't endorse you if you think it'll hurt you. I said, no, I actually think it'll help me. So uh, uh, he said, I, I must say this to you, in all honesty, as part of our, our friendship, this is the only time I will ever <laughs> endorse you. Anyway, he did, and I think it did help. So maybe my centrism there. The other thing to say, too long an answer, but briefly, people always say, why did Al Gore choose you, making you the first Jewish American on a national ticket? So it was many different things, but one of them was that Al Gore, Bill Clinton, and I had come out of a group called the Democratic Leadership Council, which was a centrist democratic group founded in the 1980s, existed through the 90s. So he felt, Al, I think that we were of like mind, which we were, and that he would essentially, in addition to whatever else drew him to me, that we would double down on his um, brand as a, a centrist Democrat. So in a weird way, my centrism, though it was risky, <laughs> had ultimately forced me to run as an independent in 2006, uh, I think actually helped me in my career. And look, whether it helped me or hurt me, I reached the point where I decided, hey, I, somehow, miraculously, I'm a United States senator. Now what am I going to do? Spend all my time uh, sort of bobbing and weaving to make sure I get elected again? I have an opportunity to do something. If I think being a centrist enables me to do it, uh, I'm going to take that risk. And uh, I have no regrets for having done that. Great. One last question. Yes. Um, can you tell us a little bit about No Labels? Ah, thank you. No Labels is a group founded in 2010 by one person, often happens in our society, one person with an idea and drive, Nancy Jacobson. She had been a uh, kind of a professional fundraiser for Democratic candidates, uh, particularly Senator Evan Bayh of Indiana, a wonderful person. 2009, she, got, she watched the partisan way in which Congress was responding to the Great Recession of 2008. And she got fed up, and she said, I'm going to try to create an organization uh, she called it No Labels, meaning, uh, I suppose it's clear, um, th this should not be about a label about whether you're a Democrat, Republican, liberal, or conservative. This should be about America and how we work together to make the country better. And um, I, got, I supported her from the beginning, but I was in the Senate from 2010 to early 2013, so I couldn't spend a lot of t time on it. When I came out, I, I joined it actively 2000. 14, I guess I became the national co-chair. It's bipartisan, first with the Republican governor, then of uh, Utah, John Huntsman, and then when President Trump made him the uh, ambassador to Moscow uh, uh, with Governor Larry Hogan, Republican of Maryland. And the organization is really, uh, the whole purpose is to get people working across party lines in Washington Again, first we, we started with ideas, with, we polled ideas and showed members of Congress these are supported by a majority of Republicans, Democrats, and independents. You should support them. Some did. We, we, uh, it was so bad that we actually felt we were making a, a constructive step forward by just bringing Republicans and Democrats together in a room to talk about policy, which wasn't happening. And then a, a light went on in 2016 and then more in 2018 where we said, hey, practically speaking, we're asking people to take the kind of risks that I told you about to be centrist to get something done. They're going to be punished, by, or they're going to be afraid they're going to be punished by their party, by interest groups, et cetera. And one of the uh, number one punishments will be they won't support these members of Congress financially. So we set up a separate division, started to raise money, and 
uh, for them. Put your neck out, uh, do what you think is right, work across party lines, and we're going to have your back. And um, uh, it, it produced um, a, a number of people who were liberated to do what they wanted to do. Incidentally, some of the, the biggest victims of the status quo in Washington are the incumbent members of Congress who didn't come to fight each other like they were members of warring nations, but they end up doing it. So now we have 58 members in a no-labels House Problem Solvers Caucus, 29 Republicans, 29 Democrats. Here I should say we call that the Noah's, or here I can say the Noah's Ark rule. You can only join if you bring a member of the other party with you. Two at a time, we enter the caucus. We have 10 members of the Senate, equally divided, led not surprisingly by Joe Manchin and Susan Collins. Sometimes we go up as high as 20, and they're getting things done. The bipartisan infrastructure bill that everybody brags about, that President Biden came in at the end and helped, started with, with our group. So um, we're, we're, we're going to work very hard to protect um, our members and elect some other centrists this fall. And um, uh, we're, we're looking and talking about um, whether there's an opportunity actually to get into the presidential race in 2024 and either support one of the candidates who seems more centrist, or if not, whether there's an opportunity for the first time since Abraham Lincoln and Andrew Johnson to have a bipartisan third party ticket. I just dropped that as a little uh, <laughs> stimulant here at the end of my remarks. Anyway, thanks for asking. Again, I'm honored by the award, and I'm honored to be honored with my wife Hadassah, because if you know me and my life, you will know that it's hard to imagine a woman who is more deserving of a Woman of Valor Award, really. She has uh, earned it in every way. I'm proud to tell you that uh, on April 11th, we are celebrating <laughs> the 40th anniversary of our first date. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank, thank you, Senator Lieberman. I appreciate thank you, you taking the time. I enjoyed it. Before we depart, I want to take a moment and introduce um, my colleague and friend, and also our campus host and partner for the evening, Dr. Marion stoltz Loiki. Um, who currently serves as Dean of Toro's Lander College of Women, the Anna Ruth and Mark Haston School. Uh, she's been in that position for almost a decade. And as if that's not enough, she also serves as Vice President for Online Education for Toro University, which was an extremely critical role uh, once the pandemic hit in 2020 and was able to make sure that all of the schools of Toro University were able to seamlessly transition to online education. I would invite you, Dean stoltz loiki to introduce Mrs. Hadassah Lieberman. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening to everyone. Uh, thank you, Dean Langen, for that introduction. And she's right, one of the great things about Turo is we're not only colleagues, but we consider one another friends. And it's a special place because of that. I'd like to congratulate Senator Lieberman on receiving the Bruce Gould Award. It's a distinguished award. I've had the opportunity many times to be in the audience and listen to the presentations and the events they are outstanding individuals who are honored, and you're another one of those individuals. Congratulations. And also, Bruce, thank you for all you do for the college. It's exceptional. So as the Dean of the Lander College for Women, the Anna Ruth and Mark Haston School, it's my very, very great pleasure to welcome the Senator and Mrs. Lieberman, and all of you to our home. We're thrilled to be hosting this really special evening along with the Turo Law School 
as Senator Joe Lieberman was awarded his award, and soon Hadassah Lieberman will receive the award, the Lander College for Women, Woman of Valor Award. I want to thank everyone also who worked extremely hard to make this evening possible and an incredible success. I'm not going to label them or mention them only because there were so many and I wouldn't want to neglect to mention anyone, but you know how much I appreciate everything you've done. 50 years ago, our visionary leader, Dr. Bernard, Lieber, uh, Dr. Bernard Lander, lots of Liebermans around, Dr. Bernard Lander opened Turo College. Two years later, in 1974, the undergraduate women's division welcomed its first students. Since then, the Lander College for Women has educated thousands of Orthodox Jewish women, preparing them for roles in a wide range of professions, for roles in the community, and for building their families. Today, we have children and grandchildren of alumni attending the Lander College for Women. Here in this beautiful, state-of-the-art building with a luxurious dorm just a few blocks away. We attract intellectually curious young Jewish women from all over the world. Lander College for Women students are a diverse group of Torah-imbued Jewish women with shared values, professional ambitions, and religious commitment. Our students today need and seek role models. Hadassah Lieberman is a role model. She was born in Prague to parents who survived the Holocaust and came to America in 1949 when she was an infant. She has always been aware of her immigrant status and that of her parents, while at the same time moving forward to live the American dream. As I read Hadassah's wonderful autobiography, learning about her devotion to family, to Judaism, and her commitment to helping others, I was struck by how she embodies what we sing every Friday night, Eshet Chayel, the song from Mishle, the book of Proverbs, extolling Jewish women. The words Eshet Chayel are usually translated as a woman of valor. They can also be translated as a woman of accomplishment, homage to a woman who built a home for her family and a woman who has strength, devoutness, and the skills and attributes necessary to carry out the task at hand, whatever that task may be. That's a wonderful description of Hadassah Lieberman. When we sing Torah Chesed Alishona, a lesson of kindness is on her tongue. That's Hadassah, inspiring others to do good and to care for those in need. When we sing, Kamu Baneha Vayashruha, her children arise and praise her, as we see in her autobiography, that's again Hadassah Lieberman. And certainly, Baala Vayahalala, her husband lauds her, that's also Hadassah Lieberman. The Woman of Valor Award was most recently given to the late Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Tonight, for all that she is, all that she has done, and for all that she continues to do, it is my great pleasure and honor to call up Hadassah Lieberman to receive the Lander College for Women Woman of Valor Award. And I would like to ask Dr. Kadish to join us as well. Thank you. 
I'm close. Wherever you're comfortable. Yes. No, this okay. is good. I'll join you over here. So I'm very, very pleased to have the opportunity to speak to you a bit about your book. Well, thank you for your lovely words. I you're welcome. It. You're welcome. And I want to tell everybody, it's a great read. Shabbat is coming tomorrow night. Mm -hmm. Hadassah, an American story, is what you should be doing over oh, Shabbat. Shit. It's fantastic. Uh, and what it was incredibly moving. And particularly, you began with the immigrant experience, what it was like. Uh, you wrote, you're deeply touched to be seen as a role model for any immigrants who find in your story a connection to their past or present struggles and can perhaps see it in the promise of their own future and that of their children and grandchildren. So what I'd like to do is, along those lines, given the times we live in, start with your father's story. Your father, on a death march to Russia, arrived in Ukraine in around 1943, staying in Lvov, where he and others with typhus were quarantined. He was sent back to Hungary in 1944, and then in March 1945, he was sent from Hungary on a death march to Auschwitz. He and others were able to ex escape, but he faced a very, very changed world. His former shul congregation destroyed, and his students, as well as his family, gone. As you watch what's happening in Ukraine, what are your thoughts when you see Ukrainian fa families fleeing with a suitcase, often after their homes have been destroyed and family members killed? How do you respond to that? Well, when you're the child of Holocaust survivors, and you've heard how they've described their backgrounds and the articles, the books that we've read, talking about people fleeing from their homes with suitcases. And then you see some of that on TV. You hear about that. Obviously, it makes you think about the Shoah, even though as I've also read from various people, the Shoah, horrible stories, are not the same as we're seeing today. They were larger, they encompassed so many people, but this is a time where we have technology, phones, visuals that we can pick up everything and yet at the time, Joe's Jews migrated from their homes. They were frightened. They were terrified. And many of them were struggling and apparently calling out for others who didn't hear them. There was no help. So what you see in this tragic current marching through the streets from Ukraine, through the states, it affects us. It makes us very sad. And then we see people, and there aren't so many left, but those who have been survivors from Ukraine years ago. So we, as Jews, have our memories and it's important for us to be more sensitive, those of us, the younger generation. And it's, it's sad, it's difficult. And being an immigrant, as I constantly have said when I've been out speaking, is tough. It's tough, because you don't know the area you immigrate to. You don't know the language. You don't know the history. You don't know the fashion. You don't have the same parents who understand your girlfriends in schools. So it's a tough thing. So along those lines, let's talk about some of what you wrote regarding your mother, who was an immigrant. She really encouraged you to do so much. You had a complicated relationship with her. But you also helped her navigate in America. You were 
the person who really helped her on the path. Can you talk about that in terms of how that made you feel and how it shaped your worldview? Well, my mother, I called her Mamich all the time. My mother um, was a woman who, I don't even know everything she went through at this point in time. I just know what I read, what I saw. I didn't know this, this diary that she had written. I found after she died. And I didn't know all the stories that my husband and I went actually, on a trip, because you're on the board of the Bubby Yar group that is resurrecting artifacts and museum around that. And they wanted to bring us both to our backgrounds. And my background was in Rachov, the Carpathian Mountains. That's my, where my mother was. And I went to that house, and all of a sudden, the stories of a home that had the chickens and the ducks and some animals in the backyard. And it was a home that was now inhabited by a Christian family from the area who had bought the home from my uncle, who went from that area to immigrate with his family to Israel. And so all those stories that I kept hearing about from my mother, and she, she was an, an important influence and an important mother, and at the same time, a damaged person from Auschwitz, Dachau, my father from slave labor camp. We didn't know what that damage was. My parents didn't speak about it all the time. But they always said things like, well, you and your brother are stars in the sky. You have to know how to act. You have to know how to behave. Of course, it was just assumed that you needed to be strong and set an example and not embarrass my parents. So it was not simple for her to endure all the normalcies of an American life in a small New England town where my father, who had studied law, had been previously ordained in a yeshiva, and was now taking over a conservative synagogue in Gardner, Massachusetts, because it was at that time that many of these refugees who were looking for jobs, had conservative synagogues hire them. The, many of the Orthodox synagogues at that time didn't have the capital to pay for anyone. And I remember still when my dad was auditioning, he would say, one of the small New England towns. And at Corum, he knelt down on the floor, and everyone in the show was staring and looking at him, not knowing what he had done. That you, a traditional Jew, kneels down at that point in the service. So those were the kinds of things that we had to learn. Really interesting. It's really interesting. So and I talk about yes. that in the book, the examples. Yeah, and it's they're very compelling. What you also speak about is here you're you're discussing your parents and what they did, but they influenced you also to be very much of an independent woman. And as you discuss in the book, at a time when many women were not dual career couple, part of dual career couples, you always were. And you say, although my relationship to Joe and his political career was an important part of my identity over the years, I continued to work choosing employment that satisfied my independent ways of being a professional and being a service, uh, being of service. So do you think that the changes that we're seeing now in the workplace in terms of roles that women have, roles that they're taking on, and even in certain ways, um, the ways it evolved because of COVID will continue? 
How do you see things going forward uh, in terms of women and the way they balance the multiple parts of their lives? Well, I think for the last, what is it, two, two and a half, three years, we've all learned to stay home and work out of our desks at home or run to work with masks on. And not that many were running to work with masks. And the challenge, and my mother, of course, she hadn't worked. She didn't marry early at all because the Holocaust. She was a young woman, and the Holocaust, Auschwitz, was her occupation. I don't know how many changes. We can't predict anything. I do know that the struggle of being a woman who gets married, who has children, those are challenges to each of us. And being married to a politician is its challenge with its scheduling and its crises. You know, I, I remember Joe's talking about his challenge of being the, the, the um, democratic challenge about taking over and wanting to get you out of office when you had a demo. And he had to, all of a sudden, I'm looking at him, I'm thinking, oh, Joey, so are you going to do something else? And he said, no, I'm going to run as an independent. He already had a lawyer there. They were all working. He's <laughs> going to be an independent. And I thought, wow, this is funny. This is amazing. And yet, if you, as a person, as a woman, cannot jump that rope and deal with that crisis, whatever the crisis is, with a husband, with a family, with a child, whatever those crises are, the strength, and this is not saying that women are superior to men. I'm not taking that charge. But I am saying, in a way, we are very strong. We have to be. In Brera, we have to be strong. And we have to also understand the balances that we always have to achieve in our lives as we move forward in marriage and mothering. And I know that now that I, we have one child, one daughter in Israel, made Aliyah, with her five baby boys, 11 to two and a half, and a husband, of course. <laughs> I didn't want to leave that up. And a granddaughter who made solo Aliyah, and another granddaughter who's who knows what, working there for the summer. And the challenges of that, and I share that, there are a lot of people in Riverdale who have children who've made Aliyah, and they get it. They get it like no one else does if you have children who've made Aliyah, and whenever anything goes on, it's not exactly the way you want it to go on. But that's true about mothers, and those of us who are lucky to be parenting with a partner. It's very important. So, Mrs. Lieberman, you referred to um, Capitol Hill, some of those changing roles. We now have a second gentleman. Uh, you mentioned that when uh, your husband was in the Senate Attorney General, you had moved to a part-time career. Do you think women who are political spouses have more opportunities now to work full-time, to do other things? Um, and also, how do you see the role, the way men's roles are evolving? Because they're becoming the accompanying spouse in a variety of situations today. Right. Well, particularly those who have mastered the gourmet ability to cook. Now, that's not <laughs> anything, not him, <laughs> but um, a lot of other people have. Look, they're, we're different as women. We have careers. We make money. You know, I'm not right now. I had to sort of slow down stuff with everything going on. But we're all, we all have challenging roles now. And 
women who are married to men of, as I said earlier, any category, a doctor who's in and out of the house forever, a lawyer who's in and out of the house forever, whatever it is, an actor who's in and out of the house. We have, all have challenges. And as women in professions, we are in and out of the house and have to find the right people to help us. And that's one thing about economics. If you're able to afford help, that changes your life. If you're not, it's difficult. As the people going through COVID, they couldn't have their babysitters, their childcare help. They had to manage it themselves or with the husband at home. And that was the difference. What's going to ha happen? You know, I'm not a predictor. I have no idea. Who knew what th that this would happen? COVID was a crazy surprise to all of us. And it required us to learn how we felt at home working. I remember Joey, he was in his office all day. And I'm thinking, he's not going into the office. His office was busier in his, you know, his study. He didn't have to commute. And people found that to be true as well, that working out of the house, you worked for more hours. So the challenges are getting back. This is the first time we've come out with everything Zoom to come. I remember when they asked us a while back, I thought, well, we don't know if we can do that. And I brought my mask because we want to go to Israel, and I always get worried about catching anything in the meantime. So these are our challenges. We never knew we'd have them. And what our challenges are next, we don't know. We just keep praying that there's more Shalom Bayit in the world as we look around at what's happening. And in... And in our... Eretz Yisrael, we just want more peace. The Abrahamic Accords, you know, we're hoping they bring us together, and yet there's still, like, you know, just talking to Hani, our daughter who made Aliyah the other day, and she said, she said, oh, tell Daddy, because you hadn't come back from Washington, tell Daddy that we were just told by Bennett, it was in Hebrew, so I didn't understand it, that People who are licensed should carry their gun with them every day now. And apparently someone in B'nai Brock, they're on a bus, wasn't it? Or somewhere else, I don't know. In a fraud. And they, so they, this Israeli took his gun out and killed the terrorist. And you say, oh my God, this is really true. So we just got to keep fighting to make things better. As I said, Ain Brera, which is such a powerful two words, I think, because there's no choice. There's no choice to our being strong as Jews. So one last question. But before then, I just want to share with you, when you're talking about women's roles, um, we had a panel of a group of our alums majoring in biology the other evening, uh, talking to some of our current students. And one of the students who's a doctor um, was, had her five-week-old baby on her lap. And another one of our students who was, was in the uh, pharmacy school here uh, and is just received her PharmD degree, you can hear whenever she spoke in the background, two of her kids from their cribs, she told us, singing songs from the Haggadah. So what we expect and what we allow has changed with COVID, exactly to your point. So before we finish up, tell us what's next for you. Well, finishing my book took a whole lot of time. And, you know, I'm trying to figure it out. I really am working on trying to figure it out slowly, but and I do ask my husband every now and then for his opinion. <laughs> and 
we're, you know, I got to figure it out in between the Chagim. And they keep, I feel like there's a Chag and, oh, I got a trip to Israel. And then we're back and then you have to catch up with everything. So I'm open to suggestions and I got to figure it out. Yeah, and I, I guess that's true about a lot of other colleagues. Oh, and I got to point out, you know, my roommate from Stern College is here. I was so shocked. She came in from Brooklyn. Rochelle, so nice. I think we have confidence that whatever you do next will be an incredible right. home run, and we look forward thank to you. it. So thank first you, of all, sweetie. thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. And now what I'd like to do um, is invite the senator and my colleague, Patty Salkin, to come to the stage. Patricia Salkin is the Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs and the Provost of at Graduate and Professional Schools at Turo University. Ooh, we all love saying that, Dr. Kadish. Uh, and she's also the former dean of the Turo Law Center. So it's my great pleasure to invite her up. But I have to say also, that we've re made references to COVID and what we've dealt with over the last year. And without Provost Salkin's incredible guidance, leadership, and wisdom, it would have been much, much more difficult. So it's a pleasure to invite her to take my seat. Thank you. Great. Wow. The, the conversations were really fantastic, and it gave us all a chance to get to know each of you a little bit more uh, personally. And while you were speaking, people were furiously writing questions. And so I have a bunch of questions from the audience. Um, we started a little late, so we're only going to take uh, these questions for about uh, 10 or 12 minutes, because we promised everybody that they would get out, especially you, by uh, 7.30. So we'll, we'll do the best we can. Okay. Senator, I'm going to start Thank with you, you and uh, point of privilege for the law school. There's a ton of cards here that are asking for uh, your opinion about uh, how to fix the Supreme Court nomination process and how do we get the centrist approach uh, to, uh, to confirming Supreme Court justices. Uh, I guess the honest answer is that it ain't easy. But so um, uh, what's happened with that uh, process is a reflection of the overall trends toward uh, partisanship of everything in uh, Washington. The, the, if there is such a word, the partisanization, <laughs> partisanation of uh, everything in Washington. And um, so, look, presidents who have nominated Supreme Court justices over our history have generally um, wanted people who reflected their points of view or who at least they thought were capable. And, you know, it's not, and the reaction generally uh, was, was um, uh, in the same spirit uh, among uh, members of the Senate who have the, uh, the role under the Constitution to advise and consent. Uh, there have been controversial Supreme Court nominations over our history uh, that were divisive, um, but the, generally speaking, people feel that uh, President Reagan's nomination of Justice of Judge Robert Bork, who, who I actually had as a professor at law school, and I think he would have made, though I disagreed with him on a lot, would have made actually a, a superb Supreme Court justice, but he was torn apart, and, and as some others have said, uh, he was the last Supreme Court nominee who actually answered the questions of the members of the Senate Judiciary Committee honestly. He actually told people what he believed, which pleased some and displeased others, and that was the end of his uh, candidacy. But, but since then, um, not so long ago, uh, both, as you may remember, both Justice Ginsburg and Justice Scalia, one speaking simplistically to the left, one to the right, 
Both were confirmed by the Senate with over 90 votes. Hard to believe that could happen. Uh, and it happened not so long ago. So we, uh, here, I guess my answer to that is this. Uh, with the general lessening of the partisanship in Washington, there will, be, there will come a lessening of the partisanship around uh, Supreme Court nominees. And it would be a good thing for our country. And uh, for, the, for the rule of law, uh, which is one of the great characteristics of our country. I must say, without dwelling on it, because I don't want to carp, <laughs> that the, uh, the decision of the Supreme Court in the, in the famous case of Bush v. Gore was seen <laughs> by too many people as a partisan decision, not a legal decision. And uh, obviously, I have a self-interest in it, but that was a bad place to have come, and uh, I hope Apart from what happened in that case, we should never be at that point. We should always feel that judges decide based on the law, not based on uh, politics. So do you think that that is the public perception today? Yeah, I think the look, Justice Stevens, who dissented, and he was a Republican, or at least he was a Republican, appointed by President Ford. And he had a famous line in his dissent, which was, and I paraphrase, we may never know who actually won the, the 2000 presidential election. But one thing that we will know forever is that the Supreme Court of the United States lost uh, the respect of a lot of people in our country for this decision. It was a, quite a personal and bitter dissent, but I'm afraid uh, that on polling you find that um, the American people have a, a much l a lower view of the Supreme Court than they have traditionally in our history. And again, that's not, uh, that's not good for our country. Mrs. Lieberman, um, you are what is called a 2G, the second generation uh, after survivors. And you write in your book about the differences between your parents as survivors and what they didn't, did and did not talk about, and how your mother left a page uh, in a diary, and how your father made a recording about his experiences and wrote a book, um, obviously to tell a story and to make sure that people don't forget. So what do you think is the best form of Holocaust education for all children, Jewish and not, and for adults? And maybe this is part of the next step. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot coming out for children today about the Shoah. And I've seen some of it, and it, some of it's good, and some of it's inappropriate, I think. Mm -hmm. To convey stories, ideas, history about such a horrible, horrible period of time is difficult mm -hmm. when you're dealing with young children, and yet it's our obligation. One of the reasons I wrote the book, I didn't think I was going to write a book on the show, huh? but because my parents, look, it was always part of my life as it is for all children of survivors. You know that that's your background, and you know there's a lot you may not know about when you hear both of your parents. And most of what I learned was through the diary that I found after my mother died. And I found it in the garage with all her things that had come out of the Hebrew home in Riverdale. And I think that part of the problem is that as a survivor's child, Here's an example. Our postman, he is a guy who comes to our building, and he's downstairs, and he's always friendly. And then all of a sudden, he, he got the audio of my book, Hadassah. And he knew, because the doorman knew about it. And he said to me, I never knew anything about the Holocaust. 
It was an alien story. I listened to the audio and I was very touched by it. That was really important. When I heard him say that, that's part of why I wanted to write this book. And I also, because of the fact that I was born in this country and the last 39 years am married to someone who was at that point US senator and had been through the United States as such, I realized that I had an ability to discuss my background, the Shoah, in a normal way as the wife of a US senator or a retired US senator and talk about that to anyone who wanted to listen and learn from what I was sharing. And so we do the best we can. I don't have an answer as to how we need to tell kids, but we need to tell them about their background. The show uh, is part of their background. And you're not going to expect survivors who had the countries we're talking about actually attack them or help the Nazis to be too simpatico about hearing and reading. We're the next generation, and the state of Israel has to be mindful and move forward in a progressive, decent way with our strength. We're not afraid to commemorate. Now one, one last question that I think I'm, I'm going to combine. There's a series of cards asking the same thing, and I think uh, both of you might have uh, responses. Um, Hadassah, because of your communications background, and, and Senator, because of um, government. But the, the questions are, are you concerned, and what can we do about the rise of anti-Semitism, uh, posing a risk for Jews becoming involved in politics and government, and the threat to uh, religious liberties in today's political climate. Do you have any advice? I think, Joey, you should. Okay, well, I do. Look, um, I, I, will, I will say, I begin my answer with my own experience in uh, 2000, uh, because it was a first, and I can tell you that I faced no anti-Semitism in the 2000 election. Um, and I don't want to, relitigate the results of the election, but <laughs> politics is like sports. It comes down to numbers. Forget the Electoral College for a moment. Al Gore and I, in other words, the ticket on which, for the first time in American history, there was a Jewish American got uh, 545,000 more votes than the other ticket. So that was the indication that America was not judging uh, our ticket based on the fact that somebody Jewish was on it. But I always say to people, don't get me wrong, it's not that I felt there were no anti-Semites in America, it's just unfortunately a part of the human condition, almost wherever you are, there are anti-Semites, it's a longer topic. But the prevailing ethic in our country would, would, was, did not uh, give them the, 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 the thought that they could possibly come out from under the rocks and, and be overtly anti-Semitic. Well, something has happened to change that because obviously uh, that's changed in our uh, country now. And um, uh, it has to do with a lot, a lot of uh, upheaval in our economy, in our culture. Uh, people are unsettled, so Jews become scapegoats. And of course, I think the internet is probably the biggest yeah. cause because I spent a lot of time trying to understand the background of the two people who were killers in the synagogue in Pittsburgh and in Poway, California. And they were not members of any neo-Nazi group. Nobody much knew who they were, but it turned out that both of them were rabid, uh, rabidly involved in um, racist, bigoted, anti-Semitic chat rooms on the internet. And if you're, if you're 
well, if you're vulnerable or whatever you are, hateful, they both went out and got weapons and decided simply mm -hmm. to kill Jews because they were Jews. So there is a resurgence going on, and uh, my answer to what do you do about it, we, we have learned enough or should have from all of our history, particularly the last 100 years, to fight it. I don't, uh, I don't overstate the existence of anti-Semitism. I think this country is still pro-Semitic, or will judge people based on their qualities. Um, but uh, the, the limits are off on too many of the haters. And it's not just Jews. You see these terrible attacks on Asians just because they're Asians. You see the increase in violence against African Americans simply because of the color of their skin and, and so on. So I see my friend Rob Schwartz over there uh, who worked with Bruce Gould and others to do this remarkable film on Menachem Begin. And um, I, I recently spoke in Israel at the Begin Center they asked me to speak about the global rise of anti-Semitism, and I read, I began with a quote from Begin that he wrote in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. And he said, and this ties into what Hadassah has been saying, from the, I'm paraphrasing, the ashes and the blood and the tears, he never said the Shoah, but we all know that's what he meant. There arose a human creature that had not been seen on the earth for more than 1,800 years. And, and he described that creature in very direct, almost simple terms, the fighting Jew. And he said, we must and we will never let that creature uh, disappear again. So what's my answer to what we do about the rise of anti-Semitism? Don't overstate it. It's not the characteristic American response, but everywhere it occurs, let's be fighting Jews and let's get our non-Jewish friends to fight alongside us to, to stop it before it spreads as we should join our non-Jewish friends in fighting against racism and bigotry of all kinds. Thank you. So in, in conclusion, I'd like to thank both of you for honoring us with your presence uh, tonight and allowing us to honor you with some well-deserved uh, awards and recognition from Turo University. And I think that uh, one of the things that was apparent listening to the conversation with both of you, um, I didn't always think about centrist, but I think about both of you as doing the right thing and being role models for all of us in thank that you. regard. So I, I want to thank you. I want to thank Bruce Gould and, uh, and Jean and Robert Gould for coming uh, tonight. I want to thank Dean Langan and Dean Marion stokes loike for hosting us tonight and for coming together. And that's been a big theme uh, at Turo University over the last few years about coming together because we're stronger together. So thank you for uh, providing this forum and I'd like to thank your teams and the teams across Turo University that were, uh, did all of the background work for months to pull this event together uh, to make it seamlessly special. Well so, done. Thank you all. Thank you. And have a good night, everyone.